joining us. Um, hopefully you can all hear and see us. Um, we will shortly um, share some slides as well. Um, and if you have any issues uh, seeing those, um, yeah, when they when when you they should be on screen, just raise a hand, uh, and we will be able to um, unmute you to to check what the issue is. Um, so I'm going to be handing over shortly to uh, Pete Davies, first of all, from uh, Plymouth University to um, to take you through this. Um, it's quite an interesting uh, topic. I'm I'm keen to hear a lot about myself. Um, lots of tagging is some very important recreational species gathering some vital data uh, for us that certainly helps some of the campaign work we do at the Angling Trust as well uh, and will do for years to come. Um, once we get going there will be opportunities to ask questions um, I'd say there's two ways in which you can do that either drop your question into the chat uh, and we will give you the opportunity to speak further to that once we come to it um, or raise a hand uh, and we, we will come to you at that point. Um, as a guest of the meeting, um, you, you won't be able to turn your microphone on or your camera until we uh, until we approve that. So, as I say, raise your hand, drop uh, drop a message in, in, in the chat and, yeah. uh, and we will come to you um, once once we get through the, the topic that's being discussed at the moment. So, um, yeah, any questions, let us know at any point. Um, I'm going to hand over and, and thank uh, thank Pete now and, and let's. Uh, Let's all enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grant. Share my screen with everybody. And if somebody could speak up and confirm they can see my. Yeah, okay. the screen. Thank you. Great. Yeah, so very good evening, everyone. It's a it's a great pleasure uh, to be here um, and telling you about our um, project Angling for Sustainability. Um, my name is Pete Davies. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Plymouth. Uh, I'm going to be presenting alongside my colleague Alice Hall. Um, and we've also got members um, from the various partners on the project that are going to um, introduce themselves a bit later. Um, and the aim of this evening is to tell you um, about the project, its aims, um, and we're about a year into the project now. So we've also got um, some preliminary results to share with you, which uh, I'm really excited um, to, to um, start getting out there. Um, so firstly, I'll tell you about um, the kind of structure of this, this project. Um, it's a fisheries industry science partnership. Um, and these are partnerships funded by DEFRA through their Seafood Innovation Fund. Um, and in our case, um, the University of Plymouth is the lead partner um, and an industry, our industry partner is the Professional Boatmen's Association, which if you're not familiar is an um, industry body that represents um, charter, um, recreational charter anglers, as well as um, various other um, uh, marine um, businesses. Um, We've got Natural England uh, as a partner that um, provided much of the equipment that's being used um, as part of the project, uh, the telemetry and tagging equipment, as well as being a kind of advisor um, throughout the project. Um, the Angling Trust are our kind of facilitators for all the communications that we're doing throughout this project, trying to get the, the, the word out there through events such as this, but as well as through press releases and articles. Um, and we've also got Southern IFCA, who have been very generous in providing lots of logistical support, help on boats, and is acting as another liaison between ourselves um, and the wider <coughs> fishing and angling community. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and as it says here that these fisheries industry science partnerships, um, their aim is to kind of improve um, knowledge sharing um, and also to kind of foster collaboration between organisations um, that aren't necessarily used to working together, which I think is one of the um, very exciting aspects of this project, um, kind of bringing together fishermen, scientists, regulators under all under one project to work together. Um, angling for sustainability is focusing on uh, four species, um, and it's born out of a recognition of the fact that um, 
you know, recreational fishing, as you know, is very important, both economically and socially um, um, along the south coast of England. But many of the species um, that we target as anglers, um, there's very little known about their ecology and their movements and their behaviours um, uh, outside of um, the times that they might be available to be caught. Um, so we are setting out to answer questions about these four species, black bream, starry smoothhound, taupe um, and undulate ray. Well, initially undulate ray, we've had a few challenges um, catching them, which we'll explain a bit more about later. Um, with a view to um, understanding a bit more about their their movement behaviour um, to inform sustainable management um, of fishing. Um, and the main technology that we use uh, is called acoustic telemetry. Um, if you're not familiar with acoustic telemetry, that there are two main pieces of equipment. There's an acoustic receiver, um, which is on the bottom panel here, the bottom right. This is effectively uh, an underwater microphone or a hydrophone that sits on the seabed and um, passively listens out for the sound of um, transmitters, which is the other piece of equipment you can see um, in Alice's hand here on the top right. These are three different types of um, transmitter that we use to put in marine animals. Um, these send out an, um, an ultrasonic signal called a ping every roughly two minutes in the case of this this project um, and um, by building up a picture of how um, animals move between receivers um, you can start to, to build up a picture of how how they're using the marine environment um, and what kind of time different times they're using different habitats for example um, and also long distance movements um, through deploying an underwater network of receivers. Um, case of angling for sustainability, um, we've now developed a network stretching um, from Dorset right through the Solent um, with a view to, to looking at the movements of, of our target species. Um, towards the, the western end of this map here, um, these are receivers that were deployed with a, with a primary focus on bream habitat particularly bream nesting areas. Um, so we've got clusters within Pool Bay at Southbourne Rough and at um, Pool Patch and Pool Rocks. We've got Swanage Bay, um, Dancing Ledge. Um, we've also got some at, um, off Kimmeridge and now also some off Portland Bill. So places that are fairly well known, um, hotspots for, for bream angling and as well as bream nesting during their, their um, reproductive season. Uh, towards the eastern end, um, we've got receivers deployed around the Solent um, in, in kind of um, fences or gates, as we call them, with the idea being that any tagged fish that swims through the Solent, for example, this, this gate of receivers here at the western end of the Solent, those fish won't be, be missed. So we'll be able to know exactly when they're transiting through that, that stretch of water. Um, and similarly, as they, as they pass through around the major headlands. Um, and we've also got receivers deployed in the eastern Solent around the uh, kind of major rocky reefs in that area, um, as well as some additional receivers that we had left over from previous projects that are still in the water. Um, so we're effectively trying to expand this network of, of underwater receivers to improve our, our coverage um, of the sea. Um, these are the main research questions that we're aiming to address as part of the project. Um, so things that are all vital um, vital pieces of information when you're trying to come up with ways of of managing fish so for example how loyal are they how loyal are individuals to um, feeding or breeding locations from year to year um, past different sites used by the same individuals um, year on year and how long are they actually at those locations these these key habitats um, uh, so therefore what what would be the appropriate timing of, of um, measures to protect them at those those key sites. Um, does catch and release angling have any any effect on behaviour or reproduction or mortality? Um, and particularly with a with a view to thinking about um, uh, bream um, during their, their nesting sort of season, as well as how far do fish migrate? Um, 
uh, and um, sort of how large therefore is the area that's needed to protect them um, and can populations be managed as separate stocks and I've shown you the map previously of, of our receivers um, along, the, along the south coast um, but what that doesn't show is that these these receivers are also part of a much broader scale network of receivers that extends now all the way through Europe um, uh, down into the Mediterranean up into Scotland, Norway, um, in the even as far as the Azores. So any fish that we tag uh, as part of this project has the potential to be picked up on those um, other receivers managed by other people through kind of compatibility, which is which is really exciting. Um, Alice is now going to tell you a little bit about the black bream aspects of the project, so I'm going to hand over to her now. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, I'm going to attempt to take over this presentation, see if it works or not. It may or may not. I'm going to allow you. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. Um, so as part of this project, we've been engaging in quite a lot of the stakeholders and with the local anglers in the areas that we're doing the work. Um, so we've held two black green workshops so far this year. The first one was in Poole um, and the second one was in Weymouth. And it was mainly to introduce the project to let the local kind of anglers know what we were doing, to show them how we were doing the tagging and also to to let them know what features to look out for if they do happen to catch one of our tagged fish and what they should do with it if they do. Um, they were fairly well attended and we're going to be doing some more workshops throughout the project. So there'll be um, two more workshops this year and we'll circulate those dates so people can attend if they want to. So in terms of in terms of the um, the black bream tagging that we've done this year, so as, as Pete said, the, the bream tagging was mainly focused in Dorset. So we have some fine scale arrays um, which track the real small scale movements of bream. So we've got lots of receivers that are really close together. So we can always triangulate the movement of those fish. Um, so we tagged 42 fish within that fine scale array, which was at Pool Rocks, Marine Conservation Zone. And then we also tagged approximately 30 fish at Southbourne Rough, Dancing Ledge, Portland and Kimmeridge. So we've got quite a nice even split of fish that were tagged on different nesting sites. So these were all tagged during the nesting period. Um, and we're monitoring their movements, um, where they move after they've been tagged um, and how they move throughout the, the project. So in terms of tagging them, what we do is we go out with recreational charter boats. Um, the, the anglers catch the fish for them, for us, sorry, bring them on board. We surgically implant a tag and then we release the fish back into the sea. Um, we weigh them, we measure them, so we get all sorts of data to do with those fish and then we monitor their movements in the long term. So it's a real group effort. So in order to identify um, fish that we have tagged, there are certain things that you can look out for. Um, so the first thing that we do is that we take a fin clip of the lower lobe of the, I hope you can see my, my cursor. Um, so you'll notice that the, the tail has a little bit cut off the bottom. So that's the kind of the first identification feature to look out for. The second one is there's a an external ID tag in the dorsal, in the dorsal fin ray. Um, so this is a letter and two numbers. Um, it is quite small, but it is you can see it if you do if you do hold the fish on its side. Um, and immediately after tagging, there will be a suture, but this suture is dissolvable. So after a few months, this probably won't be there. So that'll be harder for you to be able to identify. We have also put pit tags inside some of the fish. So a pit tag is like what you'd have in your cattle dog. Um, so some of the boats we've been working with, we've handed out pit tag scanners so they can actually scan the fish themselves to find out if if it is a tagged fish too. So that's another part of the project. And then if you do find a tag fish, we've got a re recording sheet um, that we can kind of distribute and then people can let us know. So in terms of the, the fish that we've tagged this year, so this is the kind of the distribution that we've tagged in, in terms of sizes. So the chart on the left is fork length um, and this is split into different capture locations. So this is where we tag the fish. So the green bars, for example, are pool rocks. So you can see there's quite a nice split of different different size fish that we tagged at pool rocks. Um, so we've got fish ranging from 24 centimetres to 34 centimetres. Um, so we've got quite a nice a nice scale of different size fish. So we can monitor how potentially different size fish um, behave differently. Um, 
black bream do transition from female to male and that 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 size they are at which they transition is quite a broad range um so depending on what literature you look at some say between 24 and 35 so these fish could either be female or male um so it'll be quite interesting to look into trying to refine that a little bit more and trying to see if we can we can work out what sex they were and if, if they change their behavior in subsequent years after they potentially change sex um we also measured them weight weighed, weighed them as well um and on the right you've got a nice um length weight graph which kind of shows as they get longer they get heavier which is what you would expect um, so all this information is just really helpful to kind of put together that bigger picture of what's going on. So in terms of movement. Yes, so in terms of movement, what we get for this acoustic telemetry data is we get individual detection. So every time a fish swims past a receiver, it gets pinged and that data gets stored on the receiver. So this here is called an abacus plot. So um, on the Y axis, these are all individual animals that have been tagged and along the bottom is time. So the different colours represent fish that were tagged at different places. So you've got um, you've got on the, the dark blue ones here. So these ones are pool patch fish. So you can see they were, they were tagged there and they stayed there for quite for a, a few weeks and then they went off to different sites. These green ones here are from Southbourne Rough. So some of the ones from Southbourne went to Dancing Ledge and then these pink ones here are Dancing Ledge and again some of these have gone to different locations um, and I'll show you some maps shortly to show you where they go. Interestingly these ones here in the kind of purpley brown so these were the ones that we tagged on Portland Bill and they behave very differently to the ones that we tag on the nesting site so this is something they're really going to dig into and see kind of what behaviour they exhibit when they're not on the nesting sites and where they might, might potentially go. So just an artefact of when we download receivers. So the fact that we haven't got any detections on these receivers after this red dotted line is because that's when we downloaded it last. We haven't got any data since then. So it's not the fact that they've left those sites. It's just we haven't got the data to fill in that picture yet. So our next download will be in April and then we'll be able to fill in fill in the blanks. So hopefully you can see this OK. So this is a, a map of so the blue dots on here are all the receivers that Pete talked about earlier. So this orange star indicates where the fish were tagged. So in this case, Pool Rocks, MCZ, and the yellow arrows indicate where they went. So the majority of the black bream went to the west. So they went to, to Portland, into Lime Bay, and also to the Mussel Farm as well, which is further off the, off the shot. But we did have, we had one that went all the way to the French Banks, which is off the Sussex coast. And we had one that went to Benbridge, which was off the east coast of the Isle of Wight. Um, so they don't all necessarily do exactly the same thing. There's still unique behaviours occurring within those those groups of fish that were tagged at similar times. So that was from Paul Rock's MCZ. When we look at the fish tagged from Southbourne, again, most of them go west. And then you've got one that visit one that visits Benbridge on the east coast of the Isle of Wight. That's obviously a popular bream holidaying spot. When you look at Kimridge. Um, again, most of them go west and two of them, one of them goes to a place called Boulder Bank, which is off Selsey, and the other one goes to, to Benbridge again. Um, they do travel between different nesting sites, so the ones tagged at Kimbridge did visit Dancing Ledge for a short period before going back west, um, so they do swap and change. The ones tagged at Dancing Ledge, again, most of them went west, but some of them went east, um, so there's quite a lot of different kind of patterns and behaviours that are, that are occurring. When we look at the Portland bill detection, so if you remember from the previous gra graph, there was a lot of data. So the blue ones at the top here are fish that were tagged at Portland bill. So you can see that they're, they're pretty resident. They're, they're there like on off, on off, on off, on off um, for quite a long period of time. So between August and November. So again, this is when we tagged it and when we downloaded it. So they could still be there now. We just don't have that data. Um, but these plots at the bottom, these different colours, so the, the brown ones are fish that were tagged at Kingmere. So they were tagged when they were nesting at Kingmere and they've subsequently come to Portland and stayed there for quite a significant time. We've got fish from Pool Rocks, which have also done the same, and also Southbourne Rough um, too. So Portlandville seems to be quite a hub of activity for these bream. So It'll be interesting to see once we do the next download at what point they decide to leave and potentially where they go. So we know some of them go further on into Lime Bay. So we've got the detections that we have from Lime Bay. Um, but it'll be interesting to 
put together all, all the receivers in one kind of plot and see what they do throughout the year and what they do when they come back in subsequent years as well. Okay, Thanks. so I'll hand back over to Pete. Thanks, Alice. Um, on the Shark and Ray side of things, um, we have um, given a similar workshop to to the Black Green workshop this time in um, in Celsi back in October. So just kind of discussing introducing the project um, to, to local anglers up there. Um, and in terms of our field work um, activities, um, we've been out uh, over the course of the summer since early August um, on boats out of Poole, Chichester and South Sea. And thus far, we've managed to um, catch and tag 30 smooth hounds, five tope and seven thornback rays. Um, we spent a significant um, amount of time trying to catch undulate rays um, out of various various ports, but um, have thus far thus far been unsuccessful. So it was um, the sort of decision was taken to um, tag uh, thornback rays. Um, uh, to at least get some some rays tagged this year um, with a view to to trying again next spring summer um, to try and get some undulates tagged as well. Um, similarly to the to the bream there are some things you can look out for if you're out fishing um, and you, you suspect you've caught a tag fish. Um, we've got these um, absorbable sutures um, that as I was mentioned will will dissolve after a period of time. On the sharks we have um, Floyd tags as well, just below the dorsal fin, which will um, alert anyone that's caught a, a tag fish, um, asking them to to take a photo and measure it if they can, um, with an email address, um, letting them know who to contact. Um, we have thus far, as I mentioned, tagged 30 smooth hound, five tope um, and seven formbacks. Tope, um, quite a large large um, range in size range from just just over 60 centimeters to um, a fairly a fairly big one of 130 centimeters um, a bit of a smaller size range for the smooth smooth hand as you expect um, and and similarly for the for the form back raise um, in terms of initial results we've only been tagging since early October so um, the, everything I share with you is, is is very preliminary but we do have some um uh, some quite interesting stuff to share so far so similarly this is an abacus plot of all the um sharks and rays that we've we've tagged so far um um beginning from um early august until that download that first download that alice mentioned in in early september um so we got detections back from um most of the individuals um thornback rays we tagged um seven individuals but only detected two um of the of the tope of the five tope um i think thus far we've detected three of them um and a fairly decent proportion of the of the smooth hand we've detected across the majority of that period sporadic detections at the various receiver locations that we had in the solent um and what does that look like in terms of their movement um interestingly during that month of August, um, we showed that there was quite a high degree of 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 movement of, of those species species. Um, individuals smooth hound that were tagged off of sea view here, the eastern island of white, um, were detected as far east as um, the other side of Celsius Bill within a period of um, a few days in this in the case of this this individual. Um, and similarly for the individuals that we tagged near um, a bit further east towards Utopia. Um, these are individuals in blue. Um, quite a quite a high degree of movement um, during that short period. Um, so clearly, these these sharks and rays have the um, potential to be quite um, quite sort of mobile. Um, potentially less for the thornback rays. Um, uh, uh, fairly low redetection rates for these for these fish. Um, the maximum distance we've recorded so far during that that period was was a movement of 19 miles uh, made by one of these smooth hounds. Um, 
interesting pattern in the detections as well uh, in terms of when they occurred um, a bit of a peak at the dawn and dusk um, times indicating potentially a, a peak in activity for the um, for the sharks and rays during those times um, we also uh, in addition to the recaptures from the or the, the detections from the acoustic telemetry we've had um, one of these storm bat rays tagged with an external tag um, recaptured by a, um, a commercial netsman about eight kilometers away from where it was tagged um, and thankfully due to its due to it having those external markers um, he was able to uh, release it to, to keep on giving us data which was great news and I'm going to hand over back to Alice now to tell you a bit more about the communication activities we've been up to. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Um, so, so as I said earlier, we've had various workshops already um, and we're planning on giving various updates for the project. So the Angling Trust, like I say, are kind of leading on that communication side of things. So I suppose that we've got a, um, a web page on the Angling Trust website and we've also got one on the University of Plymouth website. So if you do want to keep updated on the project, the, we've got email addresses at the end of this project. So just drop us an email and we can send you any updates that we have on the project and any workshops we have coming up. Um, we've created two posters, um, so you can see them here, one for black bream and one for sharks, which just tells you what to do if you do catch a tagged fish. Um, so we're trying to circulate, circulate these as much as possible, so if anyone wants any copies of them, please do let us know, we're happy to send them to you. Um, just spreading the word about the project and letting people know what we're doing um, and how to identify them. We're planning a final kind of um, conference event, which will be early 2025. This is probably going to be linked with the, the Pollock FISP, which is also using acoustic telemetry to tag, to tag Pollock on the south coast, southwest coast. Um, so we'll send out more details on that when we know it. Um, and as I said, we're using um, pit tags to, to track some of the fish as well. So you, you may happen to be on a boat that has a pit tag reader. So if you do, please do have a go and see if you can find any of our any of our tagged bream. We're yet to recapture any bream. So the first person to, to does recapture one gets a prize. Not quite sure what it is yet, but you'll get a prize. <laughs> you can have a fish named after you. Um, so yeah, so that's in terms of communications, our next workshop we have is in Poole and it's on Monday the 22nd of April at 6 p.m. Um, at the Broadstone Conservative Club. So if you would like to attend, it's all free, so just feel free to come along. And now we are going to hand over to our partners just for them to kind of introduce themselves and let, let you know kind of what their role is in the project and um, why they got involved in the project as well. So Pete, if you would skip slide, please. I'm first going to hand over to our fisheries liaison officer, who is Edgar Moxham. Um, so without this, without him, this project really couldn't happen. So he's been he's been really helpful in kind of getting us his contacts with all the local anglers, the charter boats, and kind of bringing the project together. So I'll let him say a few words. Thanks very much, Alice. Um, evening, everyone. Yeah, my name's Edgar. I'm director of the per, per, um, Professional Boatmen's Association and fisheries liaison officer for this project. For the past 28 years, I've been involved in commercial rod and line fishing and also a charter boat skipper out of Weymouth and Portland. The sea areas I fish range from Isle of Wight in the east, Brixham in the west and the Channel Islands in the south. My role in this project as fisheries liaison officer involves coordinating both charter boats for fish tagging days, work boats for sensor deployment recovery and data download. My local knowledge has aided the project with sensor locations as well as timings for fishing and also seasons with regard to weather and tides. During the time in the role, I've engaged with different fishing communities, such as the commercial fishermen. I've spent time talking to them individually, explaining on how to recognise the tagged fish and asking them very nicely to put them back if they're still alive and if they're dead to contact me for safe return to the university. Charter boat skippers, I've met with them individually and handed out some sensor scanners, uh, sorry, some PIP scanners um, and explained how to use them and um, given them posters for them to show their recreational anglers that go out with them all about the project and to keep their eyes open for any tad fish. Um, there's been a, a big push down here um, to try and get recreational fishermen to, to understand what's going on. So there's been posters handed out to tackle shops, angling centres, marinas, harbour offices, etc. Um, and as Alice has previously said, these posters explain exactly what to do if you get a tagged fish and 
and they're very interesting. Um, I've really enjoyed being part of this project. Um, the team is so enth enthusiastic and professional and the work we are doing is so important for the future generations. Without science and understanding of the movement of fish, I believe our waters could be very different in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Um, so next, I'm going to hand over to Emily from Southern Ithaca. She's going to say a few words. I can't hear you, Emily. <laughs> no, you're muted, but I can't hear. We can't hear for some reason. <laughs> Maybe hand over Hello. to Sarah instead. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> OK, thanks, Alice. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, yeah, so myself and Emily work for the Southern Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority. Um, so we look at um, managing fishing activity out to six nautical miles for Dorset, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, we're very excited to be part of the project. Um, we've kind of got three different elements to our involvement. Um, initially, it was going to be to do with receiver maintenance, but actually we've been engaging quite a lot with them, the tagging trips, which has been really interesting um, and really beneficial for a number of our staff um, to gain more knowledge on, on how fishing for bream in particular um, operates and and kind of the the nuances of that and also we've um, been on some of the elasma rank tagging as well so that's all been really interesting in terms of uh, improving our knowledge base on on the fishing activities um, we're also providing a liaison role through some of the stakeholder groups that we um, administer uh, which is our, our recreational angling sector group and our Dorset Hampshire and Isle of Wight marine conservation group so we've had presentations from the project teams at those groups um, and attendance I think by a lot of our recreational angling sector group um, and local angling uh, representatives at the pool workshop in particular which was really great to see um, and then we are attending the project meetings um, as well and are you know very interested in in the results um, and yes yeah, it's, it's a really exciting project that we're very happy to be part of thanks Alice cool thank you very much Sarah um, and then next we're going to hear from Ali from Natural England Hi everyone, good evening. Um, I'm Alison Atterborn. I'm a fish senior specialist at Natural England. Uh, this is a really great project and I'm really excited to work with everyone. Um, I've got a special interest in recreational angling and all the benefits it provides to people getting out and about in the natural environment. And that ties in really nicely with some of Natural England's sort of purposes and aims as well, getting um, people out enjoying the natural environment and interested in biodiversity and conservation. Um, Natural England provided the equipment. We continue to be scientific advisors to the project. Uh, we attend the meetings and the workshops and definitely try and get out on boats as often as possible. Um, that's short and sweet for me. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that, that's that's all from our partners. So um, our mine and Pete's details are on here, but also the, the fish tracking at Plymouth email is where you need to email if you do end up catching any of our tagged fish. So remember that one. It's nice and catchy, so hopefully you don't forget it. Um, but yeah, so that, that's all from us. So I'll open it up to any questions. So we did have a few questions in the chat. So if I just go back to the first one raised by Paul Jennings, and if you if you want to add anything more to these questions, Paul, just raise your hand and we'll unmute you. But uh, his first question was um, why these four species? Was there any particular reason to home in on these these four species? I think and one, one of the main reasons. Sorry, go on. <laughs> I was just saying, I, 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 I didn't know who, who was best placed to, to take that one, but uh, yeah, you, you, you can uh, draw the short straw there, Alice. I'll, I'll let Pete add to it after I've finished. Um, I think locally in particular, that they're, they're quite important species. So the, the species that are targeted a lot, particularly black bream, especially in Dorset, it is, it's one of the kind of the go-to to fish to try and target, especially when they're on the nests. Um, and particularly in the Solent as well, the Solent is potentially a reproductive area for the elasma banks. Um, so trying to understand what habitats they use and kind of their movements and their distribution within that area is important but anyone else is free to add to it. I'm trying to think back to the the, the murky times of when we, we were writing this project proposal, uh, but I think, yeah, you're right, Alice, we we consulted, well, the first step was to consult with um, the fishermen in terms of what would be interesting species 
to look at in terms of just general knowledge gaps around those species and then what yeah what the main species that sort of support their businesses um at different times of year certain things things like bass for example obviously a massively important um target for both recreational and commercial fishing but we had already got a fair few ongoing projects on bass so with with this project we we chose to look at um some different things um but the one of the benefits as i kind of touched on earlier is that although this project is focusing on tagging of these um four species um having the network in place still enables us to track other things that we've um tagged as part of other ongoing and previous projects um for example we've we've tagged i think over 400 bass as part of the, the fish intel project which has just come to um an end but those those individuals um have got most of them have got battery receive um tags with a four-year battery life so having these receivers in place enables us to continue tracking those as well as other species that have been tagged elsewhere in europe and we tend to pick up a lot of um, shad um, from belgium of late which has been really interesting uh, we've had bass from the netherlands um, and belgium that have, uh, and france that have come into our waters um, so uh, as well as mullet so so it enables us to track a, a broad range of species by having the network in place that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I, I can certainly add that from a Anglin Trust perspective, um, data on these species is going to be quite critical to us as well. Uh, we're regularly engaged in the fishery management plan discussions with, you know, led by DEFRA or the MMO, uh, and we have the Skates and Rays FMP that's uh, yeah within the current tranche. Uh, we've got the Black Bream one coming up. Um, Smooth Hound, we're in the uh, channel. Uh, non quota demersal. So they're all species that we know we're going to have to gather more evidence on. Uh, so it's great that that's already being done. Uh, it's going to be very helpful to us. Uh, Paul had another question uh, relating to the migrations you saw on the, um, I think it was the bream in particular. Um, so any correlation to the uh, the warmer water to the west? So he said, is the migration west due to warmer water later in the year? Um, has Have you got to that level of analysis yet or would would that come later down the line? We we haven't necessarily um, got to it in terms of the bream tags as part of this project, but we did have a bit of a head start um, on, on bream um, having worked on them um for uh, um, a couple of years prior to this project and uh, we we tagged um around 80 bream up in sussex um and with those individuals as well we focused on two areas um which were the king mere rocks obviously a massively important um bream nesting and angling area as well as off the boulder bank um and we're combining that at the moment with a, a previous a mark recapture study that was done on bream um, by um, Sussex IFCA um, and the primary findings of, of that were that um, the, the recaptures that occurred um, of those mark recapture of those floy tagged fish um, occurred generally to the south and to the west of where they were tagged um, as far you know as far south as the coast of France um, we've had an acoustic tagged fish as well that's been picked up in Alderney um, in the Channel Islands so there does seem to be a general picture of a kind of southwesterly migration of of bream probably related to to water temperature i think the interesting thing is though the more anglers we speak to um tell us that you, you're seeing more bream later in later and later into the season and in some locations even catching bream um uh, i think i spoke to one angler that told me that we're catching bream basically all year round at certain locations which was which is really interesting and something that they haven't noticed before so um it could be that um that a, a kind of warm warmer waters are we're going to see more um bream remaining for longer and potentially even staying all year round um which might be a might be something we can try and inform um using this project Excellent, thank you. Um, so yeah, Paul, hopefully that answered your two questions, but do 
raise a hand or come back in the chat if you want to follow up on those. Um, I think Alison uh, picked up my uh, my question in the chat anyway regarding the the Swansea ray tagging program. Um, I know a couple of the charter skippers involved in that. I think that was over 70 rays tagged. So it's great to know that they can be picked up um, by by the census that you've got as well. Um, I think that's I think that's all the questions we had in the chat. So yeah, if anybody else has got anything, feel free to to raise a hand now or uh, or pop a note in the chat and we can come to you. I'll just ask ask one of my my own while while we just see if anybody else has got them. So um, is it just that one ray that's been recaught from all the species or is that just one of the Lazra banks? Yeah, so it, it's the only fish we know of that has been recaptured after we tagged it. Um, there was suspicions that a bream on Portland was potentially caught, but it wasn't it wasn't confirmed. So this was the only kind of confirmed case of an actual tagged fish being being recaptured and then re-released. Re Brilliant. OK, so we've got uh, Mike Bennett um, has got a question. So you should be able to um, enable your, your mic and your camera if you want to do both and, and ask your question, Mike. I unmute you. Um, no, you've got to unmute yourself, so you should just be able to press the mic button and unmute yourself, Mike, and um, ask a question. Got it. There we Thank go. You. Right. Um, do the when the bream move around from uh, area to area, do they do it in in sort of small shoal sizes by the size of the fish? Have you noticed, or is it just completely random? Hi, Mike. Um, good. It's a good question, but we unfortunately at the moment are unable to answer. We you know we get the movements of these individual fish that are tagged. Um, and thus far, I don't think we've had two individuals that have shown any evidence of kind of being as part of the same shoal. Um, so they, they could well be moving in shoals that that are in within sort of size classes. But from this, from our data, I don't think we'll be able to tell. Yeah, OK, no, no, early, early days. Yeah, indeed. If I can, which is interesting, though, because when we're on the boats, we catch them in large numbers altogether. Yeah. Yeah, that, so that's, they're that's moving in a shoal to start to with. Yeah, 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 and they, they do uh, tend to. Sim Sorry, go. On. It, it was interesting to see the fish, a lot of fish moving to Portland because, and the time limit because they get fished over the winter, um, in that area a lot, and they get a lot of the bigger fish, um, which we don't get around Paul, obviously. Yeah, I mean, when, when we were tagging the fish, as Ali said, you would get kind of groups of fish together, like in a shoal, and they are similar sizes. Like you, you didn't tend to get massive ones of little ones. They were kind of similar size cohorts. Um, but yeah, we'll have to look into kind of the long term movements of them. Thanks. OK, brilliant. Um, I think, Matt, you should be able to unmute yourself now, Matt Hale. Hi guys, yeah, it's more um, an informative statement, really. Um, so my, my myself, my 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 dad and and my brother have been fishing off of uh, Dorset coast for a couple of years in our boat, and um, we we were surprised that we were catching bream all throughout the year, um, and they never really sort of changed in size. Um, but we always thought, you know, we always assumed that bream were a sort of spring summer fish, and we're quite surprised at the fact that we were catching. Um, catch them in this time of year, um, all, throughout, all throughout the winter, obviously into the into the um, into the summer. Um, but also the different how they change colour as well. So they, you know, the ones during the summer had a very bright blue like uh, crest, um, and they I say it's, it's just interesting to know those, those sorts of subtle changes throughout the season. Um, but also the one, the, the the much larger ones were were catching sort of you know off off the wrecks, uh, the inshore wrecks as well. So where they sort of habitat and where they live is, is quite interesting. It's quite varied as well. Um, so yeah, so it's just an, a bit of information um, really, and hopefully you know as as we catch, or well, hopefully catch more and more, we can look out for these tags and things, and hopefully um, partake in this um, this study. 
Thanks, Matt. Yeah, that's that's really useful. And and um, <clears throat> it's yeah, it's intriguing what you say about the, the colour changes. I think one interesting thing that we've we've had access to, as I mentioned, this mark recapture study that was done by Sussex Ifco. One of the interesting things from that was it just showed how kind of um, hard it can be to identify the sex of the bream just based on their markings alone because I think a fair few of the fish that they tagged they were identified as a certain sex when they tagged them and then on the return sheets that they got back from whoever tagged them uh, for whoever recaptured them quite often they ident identified them as a as a different sex um, probably with with equal uh, confidence so um, yeah as you say they, it can be tricky to tell with certainty um, without you know seeing eggs or milk whether they're whether they're male or female at the time of capture um unless obviously when you ca capture them then they're, they're really in in i think was it war paint edgar edgar referred to the males when they when they really have that those that dark blue um and that kind of crown across their their heads um, but yeah thanks for your comments okay thanks for that pete we've got another one in the uh the chat so um so chris has asked um, and I think this pertains to one of your objectives of the um, of the tagging as well. But um, by the action of you catching the bream, do the results indicate that they don't die and stay with the nest? Yeah. So, so on the the abacus plot that I showed, the the so the fish that are tagged that we catch when they're in their on their nesting sites, they stick around for about two weeks before they then move off. Um, so it it shows it's not dead because it's moved off and it's been detected elsewhere. So it's not just a constant detection like a dead fish sitting on the seabed. It it moves to different locations. So you've got that active movement of a fish swimming around. So it shows that it it hasn't been fatally injured by the the tagging or the the angling. Just to add to that, I think um, one of the main sort of objectives of the project was this fine scale aspect where we have these dense clusters of receivers in a in a small area to really get sort of meter by meter with meter by meter accuracy of where fish are um, after tagging with a view to saying whether they're remaining on nests and what nesting behavior kind of looks like we're still crunching those that kind of um, aspect of the project is incredibly kind of computationally intensive and quite difficult to get to work but hopefully in future future events we can we can show some um images and animations of what that behavior looks like and yeah dig a bit more into what exactly happens after release of a fish after it's tagged or indeed after the release of a previously tagged fish because we have these these individual and external markers um which can tell an angler if they've if they've caught a tagged one so that's something we're hoping to to look into more yeah, we can also look when the fish come back next year when we download the receiver this sorry this year when the fish come back this year um hopefully to the same sites or to similar nests we can we can compare that behavior so do they stay for a similar time or does it affect how long they stay for we can kind of we can compare the two years yeah, thank thank you alice and, and and pete um i think sean you should just be able to enable your mic now yeah thank you graham um it was just uh, an, an observation on the, some of the tagging sites, as in some of them identified as nests. And then you've got Portland Bill, which is clearly a reef area with a massive rip of water on. And it's interesting that the fish seem to be there continuously throughout the year, it would seem. Um, I'm a North Wales fisherman and I fish a reef on a smaller scale than Portland Bill. But those fish seem to be the same as well. Sorry. The, as the man's just rocked up and the dog's going mad. But as in as in the tagging program, it might be worth extending onto other reef areas and you might see that that behavioural difference there, if you like, as in compared to nesting areas to reef areas. I'd so say I'm mainly bass fisherman now, but in a previous life, I used to look, do a lot of black bream fishing on a reef and, you know, I could sort of predict when they were there on the tide, on the tide. Yeah, certainly my experience as well, Sean, that uh, that reef fish tend to inhabit that. So I don't know if you've got any data beyond Portland Bill that would would back that up or um, any um, theories based off of that so far. Yeah, so some of those receivers we have in Lime Bay, so they were either the receivers are either on shipwrecks or reefs. 
so they are very different habitats to what we have in the, in the Dorset site and also some of our sites to the east the other side of the Isle of Wight again they're on on like reef habitat so our array actually stretches from Cornwall to Sussex and we've got a whole variety of habitat that we've got these receivers on um, so hopefully when we put it all together we can kind of tell a really nice story about what habitats are being used when and how they're kind of interacting between them um, but Edgar's the real reason we decided to put a receiver on Portland Bill because he was telling us how abundant it was so we thought why not let's give it a shot and it's given us some really really fascinating data so again working working with the anglers is just like hugely important for this kind of thing to be successful. Yeah Alice is exactly right and also I think with regards to the reef fish and their behaviour I think um, one of the really exciting things about this year was we'll be able to tell hopefully um when those and uh, when and where those reef fish go to nest so so that almost the reciprocal movement to what we've shown we've shown nesting fish caught a nesting site moving to potentially a feeding area throughout the rest of the year and then hopefully the some of the fish that we tagged on those feeding areas will get a return movements to those some of those nesting sites and it'll be interesting to see uh, how you know exactly how much time they're spending at, at different habitats Great, thank you again. Um, no more questions at the moment. Um, just to ask, ask another one on my own in case there's any more that are coming um, before we, we look to to wrap up. Um, so I, I know from personal fishing experience that there's a, a massive density of black bream um, in the Channel Islands, particularly off of Sark uh, in the winter months. Um, have you got any receivers in that area to, to know if our fish are actually um, overwintering there. Yeah, so as part of the the fish intel project, the previous project um, that this is kind of leading on for, the the government and the Channel Islands have deployed receivers. So we've got um, several that are located around all the islands. Um, we did have a discussion the other day about where they were located and potentially um, talking about maybe moving them to egg had a few spots that he thought was good. Um, but yeah, so we can definitely detect if they go over there. That's definitely a possibility. And like Pete said earlier, we have had at least one that's gone over there from a previous project. Yeah, I heard Alden you get referenced uh, by Pete earlier. Mm. Um, but they are like... Um, if you go over in November to 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 Sark, it's uh, like shoals of piranha. The uh, the black bream you can you can catch them on anything, which is is great for anybody that enjoys lure fishing. Um, okay, so no more questions at the moment. We'll give it another minute or so if anybody uh, wants to drop anything in the chat or raise a hand. If anyone has any well-known undulate fishing spots as well, we're also um, very willing to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the we problem, have got all night. Um, <laughs> no, I think I think the problem there as well. Um, yeah, not not least that people won't want to share their marks, but the the undulate ray catches have unfortunately decreased in the last few years um, for recreational catches, at least. Um, I was on a fisheries meeting earlier discussing quotas uh, and the the commercial catch has um has an inverse relationship to that so their their catches over the last four years their uptake of their quota essentially um has doubled year on year um at the same time as we've been seeing our our recreational catches collapse uh, so take from that what you will um but they are they are becoming much harder it's not it's not your own uh, bad angling or anything that's happening on these charters that's leading to uh, to that difficulty they really are just getting scarcer on the ground so uh, very unfortunate but some of that data that we provided from the sea angling diary did lead the mmo to um reject proposals in this is it area 7 uh, the southeast anyway um, they were going to up the daily catch rate from 200 kilo to 400 kilo uh, but they didn't because of the data that was presented they kept it at 200 kilo uh, so a positive positive outcome of how we can use data captured through uh, uh, sort of um, recreational um, science activities like this okay um, before I waffle too much I don't think we've got any other questions coming in 
Um, so I'd just like to thank everybody that's joined us from the program this evening. Uh, it's brilliantly insightful. Um, I did put the website address um, in the chat as well, the Angling Trust page, which has got a lot of those uh, those posters and all that information on there. Uh, we do have one more question. I'll just unmute Les Weller. Um, you should be able to enable your mic there, Les. Yes, good evening all. Really interested. Um, just for balance, I thought I'd better mention Tote because you haven't. <laughs> um, I was I was involved in the very early shark tag back on the southwest of Scotland, and I'm aware of the huge distances that Tote can migrate. And um, I'm very much involved still with Tope and Undulate, uh, not Undulate, so a flat escape up there, which is where I do most of my fishing. Um, and obviously, I fished a lot of my life in Solent because I lived in Portsmouth uh, and had my boat down there. Um, you caught three tow. I'm really interested because they can migrate many, many, many miles right into the med all over the place. Do any of, are there still other receivers in and around Wales and going up to the west coast of Scotland that are still active? And I'm assuming you've logged into the early, early stuff that we did up in Scotland on Shark Tag. Because I, you know, that's a very small area for a tote in the Solent. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Les. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's that's absolutely true. Um, we we're aware when we kind of started this um, project that although we're deploying this array in this fairly small area, um, it's quite likely that you know we might tag some of these tope and then not actually see them again in our own array, um, which is why it's it's kind of a, quite a good time to be doing this from our perspective because um, there's been a huge boom in the number of acoustic receivers that are actually out there, not just in UK waters, but across um, Europe, down into the Med. Um, recently, there's um, a, a new project has started up called the Straits Project, which is, as the name suggests, creating lines of these acoustic receivers across the major straits in European waters with a view to looking at the transit of fish for example, with the Straits of Gibraltar, there's a fence of receivers that is it's um, going to be looking at you know, whatever is moving back and forth within out in in and out of the med. Um, and I know that um, previous um, tagging work that you may have been involved in, I think, tracked um, tote moving as far as the Azores, and there's certainly large receiver arrays in the Azores now, um, as well as now stretching up. Um, along the, um, certainly into the Bristol Channel. I'm not sure at the moment what the coverage is like on the west coast of Wales, um, but certainly in North Wales, uh, there's fairly extensive receiver arrays um, um, as part of uh, wind farm studies, as well as um, as part of that Straits project that I mentioned. So there's, there's fairly decent coverage. Um, and and yeah, so we're, we're hoping, hoping that we're gonna get um, some nice emails from people in fairly far flung places saying that they've detected our um, tag tape. Um, we also do have access to, to a lot of that mark recapture um, uh, data that you mentioned, the early work, and uh, we were we were fishing, we had the pleasure of fishing um, this summer um, with a gentleman who, um, you probably know him, his first name is Pete. Alice, do you know his second name? He's he's very big in the um, tope angling world, it seems, and he he handed off to us a folder of sort of mark recapture um, uh, data that he was happy to share with us. So it's great to meet him um, and yeah, kind of get get access to all his 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 captures and returns as well, which we can compare with the um, acoustic telemetry data as it comes in. It's really useful and thanks for that. I'm, I'm assuming you're aware of all the big competitions that take part in the Solent that specifically target those species and they might even catch them like the Anglin Classic and things like that. I'm assuming you liaise with them, do you? Yeah, we, we've been speaking to um, some of the people that are organising the event and yeah, we mentioned about kind of distributing some posters and potentially some pit tag scanners to see if they have got any of our tagged fish when they catch them. But it's all catch and release, so hopefully if they do catch any, they'll they'll get put back in. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks, Les. OK, um, so right on time, right on cue. Um, no more questions, so I will thank everybody once more. Um, it's been really insightful. I hope everybody else has enjoyed that as much as I have tonight.
Um, and yeah, as, as, as the team have said, keep in touch. If you've got any more questions, you can raise them through ourselves at the Angling Trust um, and check out that website that I put in the in the chat. Um, so thanks for thanks for everybody attending and thanks for a wonderful delivery by the project team. Okay, have